Hello everyone and welcome back to The Truth Inside. In part one we did a deep dive into three popular urban legends and we're going to pick up where we left off. Urban legends, often termed contemporary folklore, tell stories of unusual or peculiar events that convey cautionary warnings. We know the nature of these stories elicit strong reactions and emotions, such as shock, horror, disgust, and this plays a part in explaining why they are so popular and last the test of time. Generally speaking, a legend is a fictional story, told as truth, and while some of the more wild urban legends are false, some are actually deeply rooted in the truth, and it's only over the passage of time and being passed from person to person that they evolve and move away from their original origin. And that's certainly true of two out of the three urban legends that we'll cover today. This is The Truth Inside, Urban Legends, Part 2. In our last episode, we talked about the film Urban Legend from 1998 being the inspiration for the legends we discussed. And this will continue to feature as we look at three more legends depicted on the big screen. Please bear in mind there will be spoilers, so if you haven't seen the film and plan to, you might want to come back once you have. For those that haven't seen the film but do want a little bit of context, a group of students are all systematically and brutally murdered, with each murder modelled after a popular urban legend. Our first legend has various names, but whatever name you've heard this legend by, you're sure to have heard it. We'll refer to it as the Hookman, or the Boyfriend's Death. But as with most of these stories, you may have heard different. In the film, the characters Natalie and Damon park up in a secluded spot under a tree. After a heart-to-heart turns into an argument, Damon exits the car. Natalie waits patiently in the car for him to return. But when this doesn't happen, she gets out of the car only to bump into a hooded figure. She rushes back into the car and starts to hear banging on the roof. As she tries to start the car, the banging continues alongside desperate scratching. Little does she know that Damon is hanging from the tree, the rope connected to the car, the only thing keeping him alive being the car underneath him. His shoes are the cause of the banging and scratching. As she drives away, she pulls the rope tighter, and now nothing is underneath him to prevent him from being strangled to death. For those wondering about the hook, often the hooded figure will have a hook, whether that's a hook for a hand or just carrying a hook as their weapon. Sometimes the story will go that a couple park up and on the radio they hear of an escaped killer with a hook for a hand and it's only later that night when they get home do they find a hook embedded in the back of their car. Hence the reason for the name, the hook or the hook man. It's likely that the roots of legends like the boyfriend's death and the hook man lie in real Lovers Lane's murders as we're about to discuss. As we know from the other urban legends we've talked about, they often come out of some seeds of truth, and over time the story mutates and changes, and additions such as the hook get added along the way. An example of such lovers lane murders that could easily help to inspire stories and encourage these to continue to flourish are those on the Colonial Parkway in Virginia. The Colonial Parkway is a 23 mile stretch of road, that links the towns Jamestown, Williamsburg and Yorktown, and it's said that several million people per year use the route to enjoy everything Virginia has to offer in the way of natural beauty. Given the route is so scenic, it's understandable why lovers would park up and enjoy the surroundings. You wouldn't anticipate that anything horrific could happen in a place so tranquil, but unfortunately, it did. It all started with the murder of Kathy and Rebecca, when on October 12th, 1986, their bodies were found at the bottom of an embankment off the parkway in Williamsburg. They had been dating for several months and had last been seen leaving the computer lab at the college Rebecca, Becky, was enrolled in. Their bodies were found bound with rope and they had been strangled. Horrifically, their throats slashed also. The police believe that the murders were likely carried out outside of the vehicle due to the lack of blood in the car but robbery was ruled out as a motive since the woman's purses were still there, same as their jewellery. 
Less than a year later, the bodies of David and Robin were found washed up along the banks of the James River in 1987. Although they had spent time together early in the night as part of a group, it was unclear what they were doing together later on in the evening alone. David had a long-term girlfriend and was expecting a child. As for Robin, she was only 14 years old, and her parents thought she had just run away. Sadly, they had both been shot in the head execution style. Again, a wallet, David's, was found in the car, ruling this out as a robbery. In 1988, Richard and Cassandra were on their first date at a party together in Newport. A day later, Christopher's car was found at a York River Outlook, only a few miles from where Cathy and Rebecca had been found. The car included the clothes of Richard and Cassandra, alongside her purse and his wallet, again suggesting that their disappearance was unlikely to be motivated by robbery. Unfortunately, whilst their bodies have never been found, it is presumed that they are deceased. In 1989, only a year and a half later, Daniel and Anna Maria went missing after heading to Virginia Beach together. They weren't a couple, but Anna Maria was dating Daniel's brother. Daniel's car was found at a rest stop in New Kent County where the pair were found dead inside. Due to the decomposition of their bodies, the cause of death remains unknown, but it's possible they were stabbed. Mirroring the other murders, Anna Maria's purse was found inside the car. As of today, all four double homicides still remain unsolved. I'd like to say that these are the only examples of such Lovers Lane murders, but there are others, like those in Atlanta, Georgia, the string of double murders known as the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, or the case of Patty and Duane in Wadsworth Park, Montana. It also wouldn't be right to talk about Lovers Lane murders without talking about the Zodiac Killer, who is said to have killed his first victims at a Lover's Lane in Benicia, California in December of 1968. It goes without saying that the additions to the urban legend are the hook and the hanging, but it's made up of a mixture of fact and folklore, and it's the thrill of the Lover's Lane that makes this legend what it is today. This next urban legend is the story of Aren't You Glad You Didn't Turn On The Light? If you weren't already afraid of the dark, you're sure to be after hearing this tale. As with most legends, details vary from story to story, but there is a general concept. Typically, a student goes back to their dorm room to collect something, a book, some notes, a sweater. To avoid waking their roommate, the student doesn't turn the light on. Later, upon return to the room, when the light is switched on, they find their roommate murdered and a note written on the wall. Typically, in blood, aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? This is certainly true of the film. Natalie is used to walking in on her roommate in compromising situations. So on this particular evening, when she enters the darkened room, she hears what she perceives to be another rendezvous. Not wanting to witness the liaison, she doesn't turn on the light. The following morning, she awakens to find her roommate dead in a pool of blood on the floor. The message above the bed in blood, aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? This legend is also closely linked with Humans Can Lick Too, or Drip Drip Dog, as I always knew the legend to be called. A young lady is alone and goes to bed with her dog by her side. In the middle of the night, she is awoken by a strange sound. For comfort, she reaches down to feel the dog, who licks her hand. Reassured, she falls back to sleep. In the morning, when she wakes, she finds the dog murdered, hung in the shower, blood slowly dripping. Where the dog slept, she finds a note. Humans can lick too. Both of these legends play on our vulnerabilities and our fear of someone invading our privacy. Our home is our sanctuary, our safe haven, and we don't want to comprehend that someone could infiltrate that. For me personally, it's the thought of someone there watching and waiting and you have no idea. Or maybe you do, but you can't figure out why. We've all had that feeling of being watched, someone's eyes on us. It's a scary thought when that's in your own home. I don't live alone, but following the pandemic, my role is now largely home-based. As soon as my partner leaves for work in the morning, my home that's normally filled with noise and activity suddenly becomes far quieter, and noises that are likely usually commonplace but just melt into the background now come to the forefront and I find myself what I would call meerkatting, that is, sitting up and listening to every little sound. 
The legend resonates because I could see myself hearing a noise and reaching out to the dog for reassurance and being comforted by that lick of a hand. It sets you on edge to think that it could be someone other than the dog doing that. Now, as much as both sound far-fetched, we'll uncover that they do have groundings in truth. In the 1990s, Snopes... Now, if you don't know, Snopes is a fact-checking website that really started out looking into legends and hoaxes. They found a similar story in the diary of a Victorian squire written by an Englishman called Dearman Birchall, a cloth merchant of Leeds who moved to the countryside. He recalled a story at a party of a man whose wife woke him up in the middle of the night and urged him to investigate the noises in their home. He told his wife that it was only the dog reaching out his hand. He felt the dog lick his hand, but in the morning he realised all of his possessions had gone. They had been robbed. The exact extract goes like this. One of the guests told of a clergyman who was aroused in the middle of the night by his wife who said... John dear, I'm sure there is a robber under the bed. I hear him moving. Do get up and see. John replied, Oh, it's only the Newfoundland dog. I just put my hand out and he licked it. Next morning, all the jewellery and many other effects had disappeared. Certainly creepy, but not as gory as the legend we hear today. The thought of someone licking our hand to avoid detection is without a doubt horrific. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to be a common occurrence. However, there have been numerous recorded cases of people hiding in homes for hours waiting for the right moment to strike. One of the better known examples of this was the murder of Marine Hedge by Dennis Rader, known as the abbreviation BTK, which, in his own words, stand for bind them, torture them and kill them. Dennis Rader was born on March the 9th, 1945, and grew up in Wichita, Kansas, the first of four brothers. Ever since his early years, he had sadistic fantasies about torturing trapped and helpless women. Despite these violent fantasies and his later admittance that he killed animals during his youth, Dennis kept up a very normal facade. He led an ordinary life. He held several jobs from being a factory worker to a compliance officer, He graduated university and was active in his church. He married and had children of his own. To anyone looking from the outside in, they would have seen an ordinary family man. But he was living a double life, and this secret life was anything but ordinary. For Dennis Rader is an American serial killer who murdered at least 10 people between the years of 1974 and 1991, before his arrest and confession in 2005. On January 15th, 1974, Rader committed his first murders. He broke into a home and killed every member of the occupants, the Eterio family, four in total, including two children. Following this, a few months later, he targeted another woman, 21-year-old college student Catherine Bright. On a side note, he also shot her brother Kevin, although he later went on to survive. His sixth victim, Shirley Viam, was strangled in March 1977, after he locked her three young children in the bathroom. Following the death of his next victim, Nancy Fox, in December of 1977, Rader grew irritated by the lack of media coverage. He wrote to a local TV station, How many people do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? The resulting coverage helped set off a panic. Rader then waited eight years before murdering a neighbour, Marine Hedge, in her home in 1985, and that's the murder that shares some similarities with our legend. On April 27th, 1985, Rader severed the phone lines for Hedge's home, broke into her house and snuck into her bedroom closet. He waited patiently in the closet for hours until she came home. He continued hiding until after she went to bed, Then, Rader exited the closet and strangled her. I'm going to read you an extract from the trial between Dennis Rader and the judge. Rader. Well, as before, I was going to have uh, sexual fantasies, so I bought my kit. Um, And lo and behold, her car was there. I thought, gee, she's not supposed to be home. So I very carefully snuck into the house, kind of like a cat burglar. And after checking the house, she wasn't there. So about that time, the doors rattled. So I went back to one of the bedrooms and hid back there in one of the bedrooms. She came in with a male visitor. 
They were there for maybe an hour or so. He left and I waited until wee hours of the morning. I then proceeded to sneak into her bedroom and flip the lights on real quick like. I think the bathroom lights. I didn't want to flip her lights on. And she screamed and I jumped on the bed and strangled her manually. Judge. All right, now were you wearing any kind of disguise or mask this time? Raider. No. No. Judge. You indicated this woman lived down the street from you. Did she know you? Raider. Uh, casually. We walked by and waved. She liked to work in a yard as well as I liked to work. It was just a neighbourly thing. It wasn't anything personal. It was just a neighbour. Judge. All right, so she was in her bed when you turned on the lights in the bathroom. Raider. Yeah, in the bathroom, yes, yeah, so I could get some light in there. Judge. So what did you do then? Raider. I manually strangled her when she started to scream. In 1986, Raider killed his ninth victim, Vicky Wurgle, and his final crime would come in 1991 with the murder of 62-year-old Dolores Davies. In 2004, on the 30th anniversary of Raider's first murders, a local paper ran a feature in which it surmised that the killer had either died or been imprisoned. Raider responded by sending various evidence from his ninth murder, notably a copy of the victim's driver's licence, as well as photographs of her body to a reporter. The police tried to communicate with Raider to gain his trust, and eventually caught a break when they recovered a cereal box that included a note from Raider inside. Cereal box for a serial killer, perhaps? Raider asked the police whether they would be able to trace a floppy disk he wanted to send them. Through a classified ad, law enforcement officials indicated that it would be safe, when in reality they knew there would be a way for them to gain data from the disc. He then sent them a disc with a Word document, and the police used the metadata within the Word document to identify that it had been made by a man with the name of Dennis. They also managed to link this to a church. A quick Google search of the name of the church alongside the name of Dennis brought them the break they were looking for. They finally had a name, Dennis Rader. On August the 18th, 2005, Raider was sentenced to 10 consecutive life terms, a life term for each murder he committed. I think we can agree that the more unusual aspects of the legend, such as the murdered dog in the shower, are fabrications told to elicit a bigger shock reaction. It's more likely that any dripping you hear will be the dripping of a tap over anything else, and that if you turn on your bedroom light, you won't see a message written for you in blood but it's another example of a legend born out of truth, and one where, if you scale back the drama, you can see how it's possible for the fiction to turn into fact. The final urban legend we're going to either prove or disprove comes right at the end of the film. The film reaches its climax when Natalie is lured to an old abandoned part of the school where she finds the bodies of her friends, including that of her best friend Brenda. For those that haven't seen the film, a spoiler is on the way, major plot twist, Natalie gets knocked out and finds out that her friend Brenda is in fact alive and also the one behind the murders. Her plan? As quoted in the film, you used an urban legend to kill my boyfriend and now my favourite UL, the kidney heist. Guy gets picked up by a woman at a bar, she takes him back to her hotel room and fixes him a drink, boom, he's knocked out. He wakes up in a bathtub full of ice and one of his kidneys has been removed. Supposedly, the kidney is sold on the black market. So is the kidney heist real? Has anyone woken up in a tub full of ice with a missing kidney? As part of the effort to dispel belief in this legend, the National Kidney Foundation in the United States actually asked for any individual who claimed to have had their kidneys illegally removed to step forward and contact them. And to date no one has come forward. Fred Herbert, chairman of the foundation, said, In truth, transplanting a kidney from a living donor involves numerous compatibility tests that must be performed before the kidney is removed, so it's highly unlikely that a GAN could operate in secrecy to recover organs that would be viable for transplant. It's the secrecy element of this legend that's a myth. It doesn't appear as though there's any documented cases of someone meeting up with someone being drugged and waking up a kidney down. That being said, there are cases of black market traffickers obtaining kidneys illegally. 
CNN World put together an article in 2015 discussing the illegal organ trade in Nepal. Kidney trafficking rackets dupe people into giving away a part of themselves, as seen in the example of Naraj Paria. He visited Kathmandu in the year 2000 for construction work, and whilst working, a site foreman approached him, offering him the equivalent of $30,000 if he let doctors cut a hunk of meat from his body. It was never made clear that the hunk of meat they were referring to was in fact his kidney. He was taken to a hospital, provided a faint name, and the traffickers told the hospital that he was the relative of the recipient. Whilst the hospital used the word kidney, Naraj didn't know the word, he only knew the Nepali term, and therefore he was totally in the dark as to what was about to happen. In fact, he didn't know the local language at all, and therefore couldn't understand any of what was being said. He was basing everything off of blind trust. Which is pretty terrifying, but it's not quite aligned to being drugged without any prior knowledge, and waking up following a drink with a with a friend to find a part of yourself missing. Equally traumatic, but not quite as the legend goes. Snope sums it up nicely when they say it's likely this legend has gained and kept its popularity due to the growing familiarity with the general public and organ transplants. Equally, we know that across the world there are thousands of people waiting for organ donations. In the UK alone, there are approximately 7,000 on the UK transplant list, a figure correct as of date of publish, 2022. Therefore, it's easy to believe that this could in fact happen, that people desperate enough could indeed pay a group of criminals to obtain them a kidney by whatever means. Let's conclude. Whether or not the events described in an urban legend are true or not is irrelevant to the classification. Some are outwardly false with supernatural elements that instantly make them less believable, and yet some are completely plausible. Either way, the truth of an urban legend is always questionable due to the number of variations that exist for each, and the fact that we very rarely know the source. It's always a friend of a friend, a cousin, a distant family member that these things happen to. The teller is rarely ever the first-hand witness to any of these things. But they can be difficult to disprove entirely, and I suppose that's what makes them so intriguing, even today. Thank you for joining me as we discuss the truth inside true crime, mysteries and legends from around the world. As terrifying or as uncomfortable as the truth may be, as Theodore Roosevelt once said, in the end, the most unpleasant truth is a safer companion than a pleasant falsehood. Take care, and until next time. (laughs) 